Hello everyone. In this case, I will present my PhD thesis. It's called the optimization of a many objective problem focused on the power efficiency for 5G cellular networks and using the self switch off scheme. My name is Luis Felipe Ariza. I study at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia and I hope you will enjoy this presentation. The plan for today is the following. First, the introduction, the motivation and objective. Second, uh, the thesis content is composed of Platforms for Cellular Networks Experimentation Non-Dominating short in Genetic Algorithm Real-Time Emulation Methodologies for CIRANs Real-Time Coordinated Scheduling for CIRANs and Optimization of the Power Consumption for CIRANs Finally, I will give a conclusions, constrict contributions and future work When I started my research, the main concern at the beginning was to create a pragmatic research. So I decided to study the optimization of cloud radio access networks to reduce the power consumption and the intercell interference. Before going directly to the thesis content, I need to introduce how cellular networks have evolved through generations. So let's start with the first generation of cellular networks in 1980s. At that time we had our first bulky cell phone. The second generation in 1990s we were able to text for the first time. The third generation in 2000s we went online. The fourth generation of cellular networks in 2010s operators delivered traffic we enjoy today and new technologies such as FEMBMS, LTEM, and narrowband Internet of Things were introduced. Finally, for the fifth generation in 2019, a a new uh, ecosystem of technologies to solve problems from the previous uh, generation. So, <clears throat> let's name for example, uh, small cells, millimeter waves, beamforming, full duplex, and dual connectivity as new technologies. And applications such as 5G broadcast, virtual reality, autonomous driving, and holographic communication were introduced. So let's continue with the motivation of this thesis. Since 2019, mobile operators all around the world started to implement the 5G generation of cellular networks, but using the non-standalone case. In that scenario, 4G base stations and the core are employed as an anchor for the 5G base station called the GNOB. If we move to Latin America, the most important country that, al that has already implemented this technology is Uruguay. And other countries in the region started with tests using uh, Nokia and Huawei vendors. So, is it possible to deploy realistic standard compliant 5G networks using general purpose processors, high speed connectors and radon units? And the answer is yes, we can do it using the platform called OpenAI Interface. This is an open source platform so you can uh, extend technologies directly into that code. For example, you can use um, evolutionary algorithms to optimize the power consumption and also the intercell interference. Uh, as well, you can uh, extend technologies such as carrier aggregation and the coordinated scheduling. And this kind of optimization shows a picture for the next step that is the sixth generation of cellular networks. Another motivation of this thesis 
is to create synthetic networks. Each synthetic network is composed of one remote radio unit and multiple user equipment. The idea is to use real networks for application testability and synthetic networks for network scalability. Both of them have to work in real time. So in that scenario, we can create an scalable situation with many remote radio units and user equipment. Let's see the main objective of this thesis. It is to optimize energy efficiency, many objective problems of doubling transmission of 5G cellular networks using evolutionary algorithms and the cell switch off scheme. My thesis is divided into this specific objective. The first one, applied and validate many objective test problems using evolutionary algorithms. The second one is identify, apply and validate models of the multipath channel in 5G mobile networks. The third one, identify, adapt and verify the scheduling tasks of 5G cellular networks to reduce the energy consumption considering the cell switch off scheme. The fourth one is define the many objective optimization problem in terms of the number of objective functions, constraints, decision variables to solve the energy consumption problem. Finally, apply and validate using evolutionary algorithms and the scheduler extension some cellular network scenarios to see the behavior of the many objective optimization problem in terms of energy consumption. So let's start with the thesis content. It is composed of experimentation platforms, evolutionary algorithms, emulation methodologies, coordinated scheduling, and energy optimization. It is important to differentiate between network simulators, network emulators, and testbed. In the first case, we have good scalability and repeatability, but low applicability. For example, in a simulation, it creates an abstraction of every entity of the cellular network, and during that process, you can forget something important. The next step is the emulation that has good repeatability and good applicability, but low scalability. Why? Because if we want to scale the emulation, we have to use a lot of general purpose uh, processors, radio units, and uh, network interfaces. Finally, the next step is using the test bed where we have good applicability but low scalability and repeatability. This is the most expensive uh, case because we use traditional uh, hardware from vendors such as Nokia, Huawei and Ericsson. So how can we validate mobile network operators? And the answer is using platforms such as network simulators, network emulators, and testbed. For the first one, it works at the link level. It implements some layered functionality of the protocol stack. And we have, for example, NS3, SimulT, UpNet, QualNet, and MATLAB. The second option is a network emulator. It works at the system level. It implements all the protocol stack standardized by the organization called 3PP. For example, we have open source solutions such as OpenAir Interface, SRS LT, and OpenLT, and proprietary uh, platforms such as Keysight, Esperant, Netas, Bali8, VAV, Millilabs, and Rodestrats. It could be affordable or too expensive 
and depends on the use, case, the use cases, the purpose of the experiment and the platform employed. The last option is using real testbed and it also works at the system level. So it uses vendor equipment uh, that operators employ and it is too expensive. Maybe it challenge some uh, channel condition as well. So let's see a survey of network simulators, some are proprietary and some of them are open source. We are not going into details for network simulators in this thesis. So we arrived to the network emulator survey. Uh, some are proprietary as I told you before and others are open source. In this thesis I decided to use open air interface. The last option to validate mobile network system is by using testbeds. In this slide, I have the example of the Poder project. This is a facility for experimenting on the future of wireless network in a city scale. And it is funded by the National Science Foundation. After the analysis of some platforms, for network experimentation, I decided to use Open Air Interface because first, it is the fastest growing 5G software adopted by an extensive community of vendors, operators and universities all around the world. Second, it runs a simple assistant level analysis of scalable real-time and 3GPP standard compliance scenarios. The third reason is it offers the best trade-off between cost and scalability for realistic cellular network scenarios. And finally, it is very convenient for developers and radio hackers to prototype 5G cellular networks in university or research centers. Finally, I need to mention why the Universidad Nacional de Colombia signed a mutual cooperation contract with the Open Air Interface Software Alliance. And it was because of my thesis. When I did my internship at Huracom, I managed this collaboration between these two institutions. I hope with this mutual cooperation agreement, new students will continue study with some 5G strategic areas of the Open Air Interface Software Alliance. After the defense of my thesis, new Latin American research institutions became members of the Open Air Interface Software Alliance. For example, in Colombia, I mentioned the IDE Tolu, that is a laboratory of research and development, and the second institution is the CPQD in Brazil. During the presentation, I will use a checklist that goes in line with the objective of this thesis. So let's move on to the second part of this thesis content that is called the non-dominating certain genetic algorithm. So I took the evolutionary algorithm called the NSGA2 from Kangal. This is a laboratory directed by Professor Depp. This algorithm is used to solve many objective optimization problems up to three objective functions. And its diversity is based on the crowded distance. So I modified it. I extended this code to create the NSGA3 that can manage from 3 to 10 objective functions and its diversity is based on reference points. So the parameters for the non-dominating certain genetic algorithm NSGA3 are the same that authors use, for example the name number of realizations. The polynomial mutation probability, the distribution index for crossover, the distribution index for mutations, and the population size and the number of reference 
uh, points when we use problems with different number of adjective functions. The NSGA2 and the NSGA3 have similar procedures. In this case, I will explain the NSGA3 procedure. This start with a random population called PT, then it passed through tournament selection, mutation, and crossover to create an offspring called QT. Both populations together are called the RT. The RT passes through the non domination short function to generate some fronts. Some of them at the beginning goes directly to the next generation. But the last front called the L front is sorted by using reference points. But how, how can we do that? First, we, we normalize objective and create reference points, then associate each member to each reference point and compute niche counts of each reference point. Finally, we select K members to complete the last generation with pop size uh, elements or members. Let's see how reference points are generated. In the left part, we observe the Das and Denis method that distributes reference points homogeneously through the hyperplane. At the top right side, we observe the K layer and the two layer methods, they distribute uh, in a different way reference points to reduce the complexity of the algorithm. Below, at the right side, we observe adaptive and efficient adaptive reference points that are located dynamically next to the crowded reference point through generations. The next step is the validation of the extended algorithms called the NSGA3, the ANSGA3, and the A squared NSGA3. Here I put some DAP, Thiel, Lomans, and Sisler scalable test problems um, such as the DTLC2, DTLC7, the inverter DTLC1, DTLC5 constraint. DTLC2 and the car side impact. Also, we observe a wide distribution of uh, solutions and the last algorithm called the A squared NSGA3 have, has very results that the A NSGA3 and the NSGA3. So what happened when we solve the inverter DTLC1 using the A NSG3 and the A square NSG A3. So the solutions are represented in these both figures. In the left, we observe the solutions using adaptive reference points. At the right, we observe a denser a, a scenario of solution using efficient adaptive reference points. So how can we visualize the solution for high dimensional problems using the NSGA3? And the answer is employing parallel coordinates. In this slide we observe four cases. The first one is the DTLC1 for five objective functions. The second one is the DTLC4 for 10 objective functions. The third one is the DTLC2 for five objective functions. And the last one that is a real object, uh, a real problem is the water problem with five objective functions. The validation process gives us a well distribution of solutions for difference normalizes DTLC problems. So I continue with the performance analysis and in this slide we can observe two different tables. In the left one we observe the comparison between NSGA3 
algorithms and the one developed in this test. So for this uh, comparison, I employ the inverted generational distance metric. For example, the first column is the type of the normalized DTLC problem. Then the second column is the number of uh, objective functions. The third one is the maximum number of generation. And the fourth one is the value of the inverted generational distance for the NSGA3 developed in this thesis. The next three columns are different NSGA3 algorithms that we use it to compare them. So if we see in green, we observe the DTLC3, for example, achieve better, better inverted generational distance values. Then if we move to the right side, the table is something similar. We use the best, the worst, and the median inverted generational distance values for constraining DTLC problems. And also, we can observe that most of these values for different kind of constrained DTLC problems achieve better results in terms of inversion, inverted generational distance value. So I continue with the performance analysis, but in this case, the inverted generational distance convergence. This slide we observe two uh, figures that is related with the value of the inverted generational distance versus the number of generation. In the left figure, we uh, plot different normalized DTLC problems. And we observe that the DTLC1 for three objective function is the fastest. Now, if we move to the right side, in this case, for high dimensional uh, DTLC problems, we observe that the algorithm started to struggle finding good values of the inverted generational distance. The next performance analysis is related with the gamma convergence, that is a performance metric developed by Professor Dan. And we observe almost the same uh, as the inverted generational distance convergence. For low dimensional problems, the fastest is the DTLC one for three objective functions. And the algorithm start to struggle when it started, we consider high dimensional DTLC problems. Finally, in YouTube, you can find a video to see how the solutions evolve through generations. So let's see our checklist. The first one is related with the selection of the network emulator whole opening interface. And the second one is related with the objective one, that is apply and validate many objective test problems using evolutionary algorithms. So let's continue with the thesis content, in this case the real-time emulation methodologies for centralized radio access networks. In this figure, we observe three different methodologies. The first one is in the time domain, the second one is in the frequency domain, and the last one is the abstract. Time domain methodologies don't work in real time. Frequency domain methodologies were developed in this thesis uh, on top of open air interface and they are tenfold faster than time domain methodologies. In some cases, for example, using more than two or three 
user and equipment, we can emulate scenarios in real time. The last one is the upstream that is 100 fold faster than time domain the methodologies and they work only in the downlink side. So the third part of the thesis content is called the real-time emulation methodologies for centralized radio access network. This work was developed during 2017 when I did my internship at Huracom. Huracom is located at uh, Sophie Antipolis and it is called the Silicon Valley of France. So let's see the server architecture that we will use during this study. So uh, the big uh, base station is divided using uh, functional splits between the remote radio unit, the radio aggregation unit, and the radio cloud center. New interfaces that come up uh, because of functional splits are the mid hole and the front hole. I use the IF4P5 functional split where signals are changed in the frequency domain. And also, uh, I employed a software only environment using synthetic networks composed of one remote radio unit and some user and equipment. So let's see the orthogonal frequency division multiplexing chains. So we have both, the first one in the transmission side and the second one in the reception side. The first one is composed of the following functions, modulation, mapping, IFFT, then we add a cyclic prefix, the digital to analog converted and the up converted RF part. At the receiver, we have the RF down converter, the analog to the digital converter. Then we remove the cyclic cycle prefix, the FFT, the demapping, and the demodulation. Remember that the received signal is equal to the transmitter signal convoluted with the channel impulse response plus noise. But in order to enable a frequency domain methodologies, we remove those uh, red boxes and we connect directly the mapping to the digital to analog converter. And we connect the output of the analog to digital converter to the demapping part. So in this case, uh, also, we have to move from the channel input response to the frequency input response and also adding an uplink pra channel. So, doing that, we remove a lot of computations and reduce the complexity of the system. Also, we eliminate the convolutions because in the frequency domain, the signal received is equal to the transmitted signal times the frequency impulse response plus noise. So let's continue with the slot structure. First we have to see how is the LTFFD frame. So for example in the left figure we observe in blue that the slot has a time of 0 0.5 millisecond, a two frame is 1 millisecond and a frame is 10 milliseconds. Then in yellow we observe that a resource block is composed of one slot with seven symbols and 12 subcarriers. If we move to the right side we observe a figure in green composed of in the top, uh, we see the slot in frequency domain and below the slot in the time domain. For this case, 
We use a, a 5 MHz fan switch and a normal cycle prefix with 7 symbols per slot. The slot in the time domain is composed uh, for the first symbol, uh, for the cycle prefix, with uh, 40 uh, time units, then 512 time units to complete the symbol. The next is 6 symbols, S1 to S6, have a cycle prefix of 36 time units and 512 time units. So in the time domain, the slot structure is composed in the axis X with time and the Y axis uh, with frequency. But at the top side, the slot in the frequency domain, we have for both of them axis uh, the frequency domain. So for all uh, symbols from S1, S0 to S7, we have the same structure that is 150 subcarrier indices uh, that belongs to the positive frequencies, then 212 zero padded indices, and finally 150 subcarrier indices that belongs to negative uh, frequency in an inverted order. So let's evaluate the frequency domain methodologies using the additive white Gaussian number channel. So in this uh, slide, we can see two tables. At the top, uh, we observe two uh, random number generators. The first one is the box Muller method, and the, the second one is the cigarette. Also, I uh, implemented uh, the optimized uh, generators using SIMD instructions uh, taking advantage of the Intel architecture. So for example uh, I am implemented the SSE and the ABX2 optimized box miller also for the cigarette method. Taking into consideration two uh, performance metrics such as the shear square and the average computation time we observe that the cigarette uh, has good results in terms of the shear square, but the average computation time is better for the box miller method. And we decided to use the ABX2 optimized box miller method because it's the fastest. The table below shows us uh, the average computation time for some of OFDMA functions. But the most important result here is again in terms of the average computation time in frequency domain compared to the time domain. For example, the downlink RF, RX, RX, RF simple show us in the time domain we need almost 500 microseconds. In the frequency domain, we need uh, 37 microseconds, and this gives us a gain of 13 fold. The downlink and uplink RX RF simple it simulates the noise in the channel. Then we compare both the time domain and frequency domain methodologies in terms of the average computation time per subframe versus the number of UEs. And here we obtain a good uh, achievement that the frequency domain methodologies then fall faster compared to the time domain. And we observe here in green the frequency domain methodologies work in real time for one, two and three UEs. But when you use uh, the time domain methodologies with the first uh, UE, we don't achieve real time because we need more than one millisecond to complete all the OFDMA functions. But now when we consider the PDSCH using the 
AWGN channel. We observe that both frankly domain methodology methodologies uh, in the left part and time domain methodologies in the right part has a good uh, performance in terms of the constellation of the signal. We see here four uh, images. The left part is related with the AWGN channel and in the right part with the EPA channel. In the left part we observe uh, the figure in red. The top one is related with the transmitter signal in frequency domain. In the middle we observe the received signal in the frequency domain using frequency domain methodologies. And in the bottom subfigure we observe the received signal in the frequency domain using the time domain methodologies. We observe here that the uh, signal to noise ratio is higher for the frequency domain related with the time domain. Below, we observe the maximum user throughput employing the 5 MHz of bandwidth. So for downlink and uplink and employ different uh, modulation and coding schemes, uh, we obtain the same values of maximum throughput. The frequency domain methodologies, in the time domain methodologies, and even employing the USRPB2000 Mini-I. At the right path we have the downlink block error rate and the average computation times for synthetic networks scalability. So in the downlink block error rate we have the first one that is in the time domain and the second one that is in the frequency domain. And we observe compare both uh, figures that uh, the, the blur in the frequency domain generates more errors compared with the player in the time domain. Now, below, uh, we uh, consider the scalability of uh, remote radio units and U.S. and employing frequency domain methodologies, we clearly uh, achieve up to three remote radio units and three U.S. in real time. However, with the time domain methodologies, we struggle uh, doing emulations with two remote radio units and two uh, U.S. So this is the video part of uh, how real-time emulation methodologies works for CRAM. So please go to YouTube, uh, search for opening interface tutorials, and inside videos you can look for this video that uh, you can see in this slide. Now let's see our checklist. So we define the emulator for this thesis. We apply and validate many objective test problems using evolutionary algorithms and for the objective 2 uh, we identify, apply and validate models of the multipath channel in 5G mobile networks. So let's continue with the fourth part of this thesis content that is the real-time coordinated scheduling for CRAM. The coordinated scheduling is a technique that distributes uh, resource blocks among uh, all remote radio units in order to reduce uh, principally the intercell interference. Okay, for the coordinated scheduling, uh, I had to modify or extend the open air interface code specifically for the round robin stateful schedule. So as you as you can see in, in the left part, I have to modify uh, some functions that manage this schedule, and additionally to uh, add the company carry ID. So how the schedule works right now in Open Interface? It uh, runs for the company carry zero and then it triggers for the remainder. But in my case, I have to modify the code to work each company carry. 
In the red part, uh, we visualize how resource blocks are distributed among remote radio units, and specifically for subframes 0 and 5, we observe that we don't have resource blocks allocated. However, they are employed for a synchronization issues. So now is the verification of the scheduler behavior for the coordinated scheduler. In the middle, each one corresponds for each component carried. So if you see for a UE0, the first uh, 12 component carries are assigned for the remote radio unit 1 and the user uh, N1 uses the remainder resource blocks for the remote radio unit 2. So how the coordinated skill works in Open Air Interface? So please go to YouTube, search for the Open Air Interface Tutorials channel I look for this uh, video that is called Real-Time Coordinated Schedule for Centralized Radio Access Networks. So let's see our checklist again. First, we define the emulator. Second, we apply and validate many objective test problems using evolutionary algorithms. After that, uh, we identify identify, apply, and validate models for the multipart channel in 5G mobile networks. Finally, for the objective tree, we identify, adapt, and verify the scheduling task of 5G solar networks to reduce the energy consumption considering the cell switch-off scheme. Finally, the last part of this thesis content is the optimization of the power consumption for centralized radio access networks. So let's consider the hardware that I use it in this thesis. As you see, uh, I uh, utilize it three uh, general purpose uh, computers. One uh, UE that is a Samsung Galaxy S8. One a remote ra a, a radio unit that is a USRP P2000 Mini I and two BERT 2450 antennas. So let's continue with the software-only emulation SNR. So the hardware I showed before, eh, I employ the USRP to validate over the air the SNR. But in this case, that is software-only emulation, I employ a, a general-purpose processor to emulate remote radio units, UEs, and simulated the multipath channels. So let's see the parameters and configurations for centralized radio access nodules. Some NSGA3 parameters such as the polynomial mutation uh, probability and SBX probability were tuned specifically for the serum optimization problem. So in the left part, we observe the network emulation parameters, for example, band 7, the working mode is FDD, and the cycle prefix is normal. In the right part, we see the path model, path loss model, in this case, the free space and indoor hot spot. Both of them uh, achieve a similar results, so I decided to uh, present results only using the indoor hotspot. Finally, the parameters for the NSGA3 are the following. The SBX probability is 1, the polynomial mutation probability is 0 0.95, and so on. So in this slide, we have more parameters and configurations for the centralized radio access networks. In the left bar, we have the power consumption model in terms of the number of allocated resource blocks. If we don't have any allocated uh, resource block, we have a pay-based power consumption. If the power, uh, if the base station of remote radio unit is switched off, we have a P-off power consumption, and the power increases linearly 
in terms of the number of allocated resource blocks. In the right part, in the top uh, table, we have some parameters for pico cells and femto cells, such as the PRB, PF, P base coverage, the gained, the maximum number of UEs and RML radio units, the maximum number of physical resource blocks, and the throughput. Below we have uh, the surround configurations and for some different SNAVs such as Stadium 1, Stadium 2, Airport 1 and Airport 2 we have difference for example number of UEs but the same number of generations and the population. So here we find the problem definition so we have four objective functions that we need to minimize the first one is the power consumption. The second one is maximize the capacity. The third one is to reduce the number of remote radio units that uh, switch on. And fourth, to reduce the number of resource blocks. So XA is a binary variable, variable a zero means that the remote radio units switch off, otherwise it switch on. NA is a positive integer number of resource blocks assigned through remote radio units. PARX is the path loss model, could be a free space, an indoor hotspot, or another one. And the summatory of the PRRX different to the remote radio unit A. That means it represents the intercell interference. Finally, NA is the noise. Now we have four restrictions. The first one is related with the maximum number of resource blocks. The second one is related with the number, the maximum number of remote radio units. The third one the capacity should be higher than the normalized traffic times the maximum da data rate using the modulation encoding scheme 28. And the last one is the power consumption should be less than Pmax. Do you remember the April 1, April 2, Stadium 1 and Stadium 2 A scenarios? So here we can uh, visualize them and how the base stations and uh, user ends are uh, distributed over the uh, area assigned for the coverage of that uh, system. So let's see the NSGA3 in action solving our problem, our optimization problem. So as you can see in the left part, we have a stadium with 25 physical resource blocks, 32 remote radio units, and 192 user equipments with a zero physical resource blocks of interference. I mean, we don't have any resource blocks overlapped between a the remote radio units and in this case we have three different normalized traffic 0 0.09, 0 0.5 and 0 0.98 in the right part we have the same scenario but with four physical resource blocks of interference I mean four of these resource blocks are overlap it between uh, the remote radio units with the same uh, values of normalized uh, traffic. As you can see in the left part, we don't have any change, but with the interference, we have clearly a variation that depends of the normalized traffic. In the last uh, slide, we observe 
that uh, the visualization uh, employing a parallel coordinate is difficult to analyze. So in this case, I will employ a Cartesian plane in order to visualize in three dimensions the solutions. So now we can see in three dimensions uh, in a better way and we can analyze uh, how is the behavior of solutions. So in the left part we have three uh, subfigures related to the power, power and data rate. In the left part we have the power but using the NSGA2. In the middle we have the power employed the NSGA3 and in the right part we have the data rate using the NSGA3. As we observed with previous uh, figures, the previous visualization employing the parallel coordinates, uh, with three, uh, zero uh, resource blocks of interference, it's difficult to see or to analyze uh, the solution because uh, the result is almost the same for different uh, normalized traffic. Now if we move to the right side, we have uh, the S scenario with four resource blocks of interference. As we can see, again, we have uh, in the left part the power with employing the NSGA2. In the middle, the power employing the NSGA3. And in the right side, we have the solution for the data rate employing the NSGA3. Again, employing four resource blocks of interference, we can differentiate for different uh, normalized traffic in different regions in colors, for example, green, red, orange, uh, the distribution of solutions. And we observe that if we increase the normalized traffic, we uh, achieve a higher data rate or higher power consumption. So here is the power consumption considering a traffic profile. So in this slide we observe four figures, so subfigures, that is related with the power consumption for different situations of traffic. The upper left is the airport with four remote radio units, 256 US. The upper right is the airport, 45 remote radio units and 217 US. The lower left is a stadium with three remote radio units and 192 US. The lower right is the stadium with 32 remote radio units and 100 and 92 US. In all the scenarios we have a black line that represents the maximum power consumption. In purple we have the normalized traffic that depends on the time. And in green we have the ideal power consumption that have to follow the normalized traffic. So in this case, if we have the maximum normalized traffic, that is one, we obviously need to uh, as, uh, use the maximum power consumption. But if not, we need to reduce this power consumption that it depends of the number of remote radio units that we saw previously in the model. So now we sum up the parameters of the emulation using the NSGA3. In the left part we have the scenario, two remote radio units with the distribution of remote, uh, uh, excuse me, of uh, physical resource blocks that depends on the traffic. We have the parameters of the emulation. Also in the right side we have the normalized traffic 
and the parameter parameters of the NSGA tree. Finally, we see the results of the optimization of the power consumption for CRAN employing the OpenAI interface platform. So in this scenario, it's a simple scenario composed of two remote radio units and two user and equipment. The radio cloud controller is managed by the NSGA3. If we move to the right part, we see a figure with some plots. In blue, we observe the uh, normalized traffic. In black, we see the maximum power consumption. In green, uh, we visualize how would, how would be the ideal response of the power consumption that depends on the normalized traffic. And finally, in orange, is the result of the uh, NSGA3 algorithm. Here in this table, we observe that uh, the maximum power reduction is nearly 40%. Let's go back to the checklist. So we selected the emulator. We validate many objective test problems using evolution and algorithms. Then we validate the model of the multipath channel. After that, we adapt and verify the scheduling task. Then we define a many objective optimization problems in, term, in terms of the number of objective functions, constraints, and decision variables to solve the energy, optimis, uh, the energy consumption problem. Finally, we apply and validate using evolutionary algorithms and the scheduler extension some cellular network scenarios to see the behavior of the many objective optimization problems in terms of energy consumption. After explaining the content of this thesis, I will present my conclusions, contribution and future work. So let's start with conclusions. The first one, that it was successful extended the official NSGA2 algorithm from the Kangal's code to the NSGA3, the ANSGA3 and the A squared NSGA3 to solve problems with and without restrictions. They are susceptible to be employed as a reference for a comparative evaluation of new evolutionary algorithms because they yield better results in terms of the inverter generational distance performance metric for different normalized DTLC uh, problems. Additionally, uh, when the a NSGA3 and the A square NSGA3 are employed, they increase the density of solutions. For example, in the, in the case of the inverter DTLC1 problem. The second conclusion is affordable and real time CRAN emulation are successfully implemented in OpenAid interface using frequency domain processing as a prototyping framework to rapid proof of concept in a software only environment. It reduces one order of magnitude tenfold the average computation time of the multipath channel with frequency domain processing compared with the time domain. It improves the applicability and the scalability of CRANs that provide a realistic system validation for performance evaluation of real time protocols at higher layers, assesses protocol correctness consider traffic congestion and creates traffic stimulus for scheduling algorithms. The third conclusion is that it was successfully extended the coordinate scheduling technique in open air interface and it distributes the resource blocks between remote radio units to reduce intercell interference. In the case of remote radio units, it switched off then the resource blocks are distributed among the remaining active remote radio units. 
Now the, the fourth conclusion, it is proposed a new many objective optimization problems with four objective functions, four constraints, and two decision variables to solve to be solved using the evolutionary NSGA2 and NSGA3 algorithms. The solution showed that the NSGA3 has improvements in the performance compared to the NSGA2 because the solutions are well distributed in terms of the number of active remote radio units and the amount of the allocated resource blocks. It is essential to tune the parameters of NSGA2 and NSGA3 to solve the power energy optimization problem for CIRANs. Finally, it was possible uh, the optimization of the many objective power consumption problem for CIRANs using evolutionary algorithms, new frequency domain methodologies, and employing the open source emulator called OpenAir Interface. The number of extensions required a significant effort because they need the end user to have a good understanding of protocols from the 3GPP standard. The proposed, the proposed software-only prototyping framework allows designers to reduce cost in USRPs, circulators, splitters, and attenuators. Also, it is very convenient for developers and new radio hackers to prototype 5G cellular networks in university and or research centers. Now let's talk about contribution. So I participated in two conferences, the SPAL C 2019 in France and Globecom, uh, but then it was withdrawn because of expenses. Now I did a, a oral presentation in the first open air interface North American workshop that it was um, called by the Nokia Bell Labs in New Jersey. The next contribution is a YouTube channel that is called the Open Air Interface Tutorials that shows uh, a lot of videos related to it, the Open Air Interface platform. The second YouTube channel that I create is the NSGA3, and there uh, you can find um, some videos related with these evolutionary algorithms and how it performs through generations. All my extensions in Open Air Interface is available in GitLab. Additional software is available also in GitHub and data part, for example, for, for the NSGA3 codes, the Gaussian pseudo-random generation numbers, and some uh, basic genetic algorithms. And how would be in my future work? Uh, I believe I will work on cloud agnostic or cloud native radio access networks because this is an important area to implement radio access networks in the cloud. Additional contribution in the future work would be introduce a cycle prefix in the frequency uh, domain methodologies implement a frequency reduced and improve the optimization using AVX 512 instructions. The second would be create a serum hybrid environment, environment with synthetic and real networks to improve the emulation scalability, merge the frequency domain methodologies into the last developed branch in an uh, open air interface, uh, this is an important uh, part that I have to do. Increase the scalability of NSGA3 algorithms, reduce the computational effort of the uplink Pratt channel, work as I mentioned before on cloud uh, agnostic or native 5G servant um, private 5G networks. Finally, increase the number of objective 
functions supported by the NSGA3 algorithms and scale new scenarios for serums. Thank you very much uh, to see this video. You can find me in some social networks and be free, please, be free to ask uh, any questions you need to solve.